Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So in my last video I went over the changes to the Ranger in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And when we look at all those changes, I'd like to take a look and see how that affects how we would make a Ranger. So I wanted to do a build for Ranger today and because the subclass of Beastmaster got changed as well, I figured let's make a Beastmaster build. Now I have done a Beastmaster build before on this channel and that is of course before Tasha's so this is just a player's handbook version of the Beastmaster and if you'd like to check that out I'll link it in the video description that was a melee build that uses a giant poisonous snake. But before we get into our build today I want to thank some of my top level patrons I have a Patreon if you're interested there is a link in the video description but today I would specifically like to thank Matt Couch Nick Lutz, Philip Martin, Rohit, Scott Ballantyne, Scott Dunnington, TUM, Takusen, and Geek Dice. These patrons are some of my top level patrons who really help me do what I do by giving me the resources to do the analysis and spend the time that I do on these videos. So let's get started. So when we look at rangers in general, I think there are a number of ways we can build them now. Uh, there has always been the option of going kind of strength-based, and then you build a melee ranger. Uh, then there's always been the option of going dexterity-based and going with a longbow ranger. Uh, now we have a third option, and that is to go wisdom-based. And then you would go with the druidic warrior and then do shillelagh in the first round of combat, and then you could do wisdom-based attacks. Now the fourth way that's kind of always been around as well is you could technically do a melee ranger that's dexterity based with finesse weapons though I find that's probably mechanically your weakest option. So I was really looking at the three initial ways that I talked about in terms of this build today. Uh, now if I was to go with a strength based ranger and I'm not going to because uh, that is actually the Beastmaster build I already have was a strength based ranger so I wanted to go different this time but if I was to do that I would be going strength first and then I would be going with wisdom second and this actually creates an issue because the ability scores are more spread out than they were before we didn't need wisdom as much with rangers before so it is actually very difficult to get your ability scores where you could have a 16 strength and a 16 wisdom and still have a decent enough dexterity and constitution so what I would recommend is if you want to go that route, you really need heavy armor proficiency. And the easiest way to probably do that is with a multi-class. Uh, and the multi-class I'd probably recommend, since you're going with a wisdom heavy build to begin with, is probably with cleric. The second was to go with straight wisdom. And the idea is you use druidic warrior and grab shillelagh so you can make wisdom based attacks with a melee weapon. And then your pet gets the benefit of your spell attack increasing and so the pet is technically going to do more damage but it not really right because if you are on the first round of combat using your bonus action to cast shillelagh then your beast is not attacking on the first round so unless the combat is really long then we would actually expect the beast to do less damage if we do it that way we also can't benefit from feats that would normally help our damage out like great weapon master or sharpshooter because we would be using a shillelagh so again I don't think that is the right kind of build for a beast master ranger so I'm thinking that the best choice for us is actually to go with the deck space ranger and so then we would be using a longbow and the sharpshooter feat now if I'm going to do that then I'm probably looking at going with the beast of the sky for my pet because we will not want our beast engaged in melee if we're not because if we're not in melee and our beast is in melee it's going to be targeted with more attacks and it doesn't have enough hit points to probably survive that but beast of the sky can deliver its damage and because it has flyby attack it's going to be able to avoid a lot of attacks now in terms of damage, this build is actually potentially doing less damage at a lot of levels than the Straight Player's Handbook Ranger, but that really depends. The damage here is far more reliable. Now we're also probably going to want to take advantage of the new summoning spells. 
And when we look at the Ranger, we're actually not getting a lot of good, reliable damage through our summoning spells. Summon Beast does non-magical damage. Summon Fae does some non-magical damage, though it adds a little bit of force damage. Though potentially you could give that summon a magical short sword. And eventually you get access to Summon Elemental, which again is very unreliable damage. But let's go through the build and I'll show you how it does. So this is my Tasha's Beastmaster. Uh, for sources, we actually don't really need a lot of sources for this. We need Tasha's, we need the Player's Handbook. And I'm going to be taking a spell from Xanathar's, but if you were playing with Player's Handbook plus one, you'd just be using Player's Handbook and Tasha's and you'd be fine. And we're going to assume the optional class features are available, and we're going to assume that Customize Your Origin is available, though I'm actually not going to use Customize Your Origin. The race I'm going to go with is Variant Human. Now, if you were using Customize Your Origin, you could go with the Custom Lineage, and it would work out okay. It would actually work out very similarly to a Variant Human. But the nice thing about Variant Human is you don't have to ask your DM if Customizing Your Origin is available, because this is going to work whether it is or not. And the reason we're going to go with Variant Human is because this is going to be a longbow using Ranger. And a longbow using Ranger wants to get Sharpshooter as soon as possible. We can get it right at level 1. For our ability score increases, I'm going to increase our Dexterity and our Wisdom. Ability scores for this character work out not bad at all at first level. For additional skill, I'm going to just take Perception. And then the feat I'm taking is Sharpshooter. That is going to let me attack at long range without disadvantage. With a longbow, that's like forever. You're never really going to suffer range penalties in the average game. We also ignore half cover and three quarters cover. And depending on your DM, those can come up a lot, especially if you're firing through occupied squares. So this is also really handy for us. Of course, the big thing is, if we choose to take a minus 5 penalty to the attack roll, we add plus 10 to the weapon's damage. We're going to get three class skills. I'm going to take Animal, Handling, Stealth, and Survival. In the case of all three of these, I'm going to be quite good because I'm going to have a good Wisdom and Dexterity score. Now, if you use D&D Beyond and you've turned on your optional class features, what you want to do is you want to go to this optional feature manager and you're just going to click off all the stuff you're going to be using and this way it'll just appear in our character builder. So Deft Explorer is going to give us two additional languages and we're going to get expertise in a skill. So I've gone for Sylvan, Gnomish and we're going to have expertise in the perception skill. We are also getting favored foe. Uh, this I talked a lot about in the last video, but essentially what it's going to do is it's going to allow us to place it on an enemy and then once per turn we can get an extra d4 damage if we hit them with an attack. And that uses our concentration. One thing I forgot to mention in that past video is one of the advantages of Favored Foe is we're actually getting it here at level 1. And we're not going to be concentrating on anything at first level other than this, so we might as well use it. Now I'm going to be doing some damage calculations for this build and I had to figure out how I was going to use Favored Foe uh, because you're only putting it on a single enemy. So it's not necessarily giving you that minute that it technically is offering unless you're fighting the same enemy round after round after round. So for my damage calculations I assumed we were going to get two rounds out of Favored Foe. But that's subjective and it might be more, it might be less. So for my ability scores, this is going to be a focused character. We're going to have Dexterity, Constitution, and Wisdom. So with a point by, I'm raising those all to 15. Dexterity will start at 16, and Wisdom will start at 16 because of our racial bonuses. Constitution will stay at 15 for now. With the background, I'm not going to go overly creative here. We'll take Outlander. This, again, is kind of iconic for Ranger builds. We're going to get access to Athletics and Nature. I'm going to take the horn as a musical instrument and primordial as another language. So again, this is a character that has actually a lot of skills and a lot of languages as well. For starting equipment, we're going to start with our scale mail. That's going to give us an armor class of 16. That is an okay armor class. For an archer character, it is perfectly fine. Then we're going to take the two short swords 
if we get stuck in melee, we're going to pull a short sword out. It's going to be able to use the finesse property, and we can potentially pull out another short sword on another round and do some two weapon fighting at low levels because we'll have our bonus action available. At higher levels, of course, we're never going to have our bonus action, and you probably want to grab a rapier at some point, just in case. Uh, then we're going to take the Dungeoneer's Pack. You could take the Explorer's Pack, but the Dungeoneer's Pack actually has a few more items in it. Uh, and then we're going to take our Longbow with 20 arrows. And with a lot of archery builds, we find Hand Crossbow. In this case, we're actually going to be able to use the more iconic Longbow, and it's going to work out better for us. So at level 1, 12 hit points is fine. Plus 5 to hit with Longbow for D8 plus 3 is fine. Armor Class 16 is fine. We're fine. I mean, not much is happening at first level yet. What I want to do now is I want to jump two levels at a time. So let's go to level three. So this is when we're going to become a Beastmaster Ranger. Uh, now at level two, we'll be picking our fighting style, and that's obviously going to be archery. We want that plus two to hit. That really combines well with sharpshooter because it's going to offset some of that minus five to hit to get the plus ten damage. We're also going to get Primal Awareness. We're going to be able to cast Speak with Animals once per day for free. And that's just a nice thing for a Beastmaster, I think, because that's the, kind of the theme of the character. We also have Animal Handling. That works well. And we're eventually going to get Beast Sense, Speak with Plants, Locate Creature, Commune with Nature. Then we're going to get the Ranger's Companion. And as I said, we're going to get the Beast of the Sky, so that we're going to get some kind of bird. And that is going to do attacks with flyby. I'm going to have three spells at this level. And the spells I'm going to add to my known list are Absorb Elements, Goodberry, and Longstrider. So Absorb Elements is always good because if we take energy damage, we can use our reaction to half that damage. And it's one of the best defensive spells that rangers have access to. I'm going to take Goodberry because Goodberry is a great healing spell. We basically get ten little berries that each heal one hit point. And then I'm going to take Long Strider. Long Strider is a great way to increase your maneuverability. has a decent duration, and it doesn't use concentration. So you can cast Long Strider outside of combat. It's probably going to last you multiple combats, and it's not going to interfere with anything else. And Hunter's Mark is something I actually will take with this character at level 2. Uh, because at level 2, I don't need my bonus action for anything else. So I might as well use Hunter's Mark. Our long duration, D6 damage each time we hit, and... What I'll do is, when I get to level 3, I'm going to trade it out. So I want to mention why I'm not taking certain spells. Uh, the first one is Zephyr Strike. This is actually often a really good spell for an archery build, because you can do movement without provoking attacks of opportunity, and you can potentially move an additional 30 feet on one of your turns, get advantage on an attack, and do extra damage on that attack, and it lasts for a minute. Uh, so often a good one for archery builds. But our bonus action is never going to be available. And why not Hunter's Mark? Hunter's Mark eats up your bonus action all the time. Not just to cast it, but to change targets. And we just don't have our bonus action again, so Hunter's Mark is a problem. And why not Ensnaring Strike? Same problem. It is using our bonus action. We don't want to use up our bonus action, so we're not going to really use Ensnaring Strike. Once again, if I was playing an archer that wasn't a Beastmaster, I'd consider this. And why not Beast Bond? Well, Beast Bond actually only works if the beast's intelligence is 3 or lower. And our beast's intelligence is quite high. So our beast's intelligence actually makes it so that it doesn't qualify for the Beast Bond spell. And finally, why not Entangle? Well, actually, I would really strongly consider Entangle. If you want Long Strider, go Long Strider. If you want Entangle, go Entangle. Both good spells. Entangle does use your concentration. That's a downside. But it is a pretty effective combat spell for a first level spell because it can restrain multiple enemies. So the big things that happen at levels 2 and 3 is our damage actually increases quite a bit. And that's because we're getting the plus 2 to hit from our archery combat style. And we're using our bonus action every turn to have our pet attack. And our pet is doing good damage. And because we have a strong dexterity and wisdom, we're getting good attacks from both our archery and from our pet. So let's hop up to level 5. So at level 4, we're going to get an ability score improvement, and we're going to take a feat here. Now, if I really wanted to just focus entirely on damage, I'd actually be better off increasing my dexterity or even my wisdom to a lesser degree. But... I don't just want to worry about offense here. I also want to worry about defense and having a well-rounded character. And so I'm going to be taking the Resilient Constitution feat. 
this is a really good feat for this character because first off we're going to get our constitution to 16 which is a very strong constitution score to have it also is going to make us proficient in constitution saving throws we make constitution saving throws reasonably often this is also a character that uses concentration and it's going to help our concentration saves and finally, because we have that 16 constitution now, we're going to have more hit points than before. And we're working off a base D10 from Ranger, so our hit points for this character overall are going to be pretty solid. So there's a lot of defensive things built in here, and I just don't want to ignore my defense. But you'll see when we look at our damage calculations, you're going to see a dip in our damage at level 4, and that is because we took this instead of raising our dexterity. And that's because I assume that armor classes are going up, and if we're not increasing our chance to hit, then damage goes down. So that's the sacrifice we make for this, but I think it is worthwhile. Huge thing, of course, is extra attack we're getting at level 5. Now with the Beastmaster, we have the option of using our bonus action or sacrificing one of our attacks to have the Beast attack and almost all the time. I think that we're better off doing the bonus action to have an attack rather than giving up an attack. Now, I realize Dungeon Dudes did a video where they talked about doing both your bonus action and giving up one of your attacks to have the beast attack twice. That's not how it works. The beast is still only going to have one action per turn, so it's only going to be able to take the attack action once per turn, even if you were to command it more than once. So that actually doesn't work. So I'm going to remove Long Strider, and this is at level 5, so I can get two second level spells. The first second level spell I'm going to grab is Aid. Aid is a great spell because we can increase hit points, uh, including the hit points of our beast if we want to, but we only get to pick three selections. And the second thing great about Aid is it works at range, and it increases your current hit points by 5. And so we can have characters that are down to 0 hit points. We can cast Aid and bring them back up at range. And I'm going to pick Summon Beast. I think this is a very strong spell. I also think it is friendly for your table. It's not going to take a huge amount of time on your turn. Once again, I'm going to be doing the Flying Beast. And again, that is so I can take advantage of the flyby attack, which is probably going to mean that our beast is going to survive combats. Now, this uses our concentration, so we're not using this at the same time as favored foe. And when I did my calculations for damage, I also had to take into account that the summon beast is never going to get magical attacks. And so there's just going to be combats where it's either going to do half damage or no damage at all. Uh, so I kind of assume that we might be able to use it effectively maybe half the time. And that's kind of an assumption because I think we're probably using it more than half the time at lower levels and less than half the time at higher levels, but I went with half the time just for easier calculations. Once again, our attack is based on our wisdom, so it's good that we started with the 16 wisdom. But the damage here does not scale with our proficiency bonus. It scales if we cast this at a higher level. And Bestial Spirit we're never going to be casting beyond second level, so we don't really need to worry about that. Now the main thing we see here is because our proficiency bonus increased, we see an increase to the damage from our pet. We're also adding essentially a second pet with Summon Beast, and we're getting that extra attack. So actually our damage at level 5 jumps a lot. We're also now proficient in both Dexterity and Constitution saving throws, and of the big three, the saving throws we tend to see all the time, Dexterity, Wisdom, and Constitution, we have plus six in two of them, plus three in the third one, so that's pretty solid overall. As we move up to seventh level, uh, I'll just mention that our favored foe, which we now can use three times per day, has scaled to a d6, and more importantly, the attacks of our pet are now considered magical. And that means that that is going to be reliable damage for us. And we're going to get one more spell at this level, and we're going to grab Pass Without Trace. This is a concentration spell. It is going to be an out-of-combat spell generally, and it is going to give your entire party, including your pet, plus 10 bonus to stealth checks. Otherwise, not a lot happening in these two levels, so let's jump to level 9. And level 9 is a big level for us because we're going to get access to third level spells. It is also going to increase our proficiency bonus, which increases the damage from our companion. It also increases our to hit rolls, of course. And it increases the number of times we can use favored foe. 
Now with the ability score improvement, there are a number of ways we could go, but I do think our best bets are either to go with dexterity or wisdom. And if we go with wisdom, then it helps out Number one are spell DCs, though there's not a lot of spells we're casting that require saving throws. So we're not really getting a benefit from that. So what we are getting a benefit to is our pet is going to make its attack with a plus one to hit. And if we have a summoned creature, it's also going to get a plus one to hit. But in actuality, my calculations say we're better off with dexterity. Because that's increasing our own chance to hit, and that's where the majority of our damage is coming from. Of course, it also helps our initiative. It helps the saving throw that comes up a lot. And if we do get stuck in melee, it helps our melee attacks as well. This is also the point where we're just as good to go with studded leather armor as we are to go with scale mail armor. So either way we go, our armor class is going to be the same. But if we go with the studded leather, we're not going to have that disadvantage on stealth checks. Of course, a breastplate would work just as well at this level. So for now, we're just getting one third level spell, and there are a number of ways we can go here. I'll tell you right now that mechanically speaking, our best bet is Conjure Animals. Conjure Animals is a crazy strong spell, and if we get eight beasts of challenge rating one quarter or lower, it can make a major impact even at higher levels on combats. The issue with Conjure Animals isn't mechanical. The issue is actually in play because once you start putting eight creatures on a map and you're already, remember, using two creatures on your turn because you've got you and your beast and now you have eight more, it is not always the friendliest play style to be casting Conjure Animals. So with this build, I'm not going to recommend it. Though I do think mechanically it's the strongest spell and if that's what you want, take it. But in terms of my damage calculations, I'm not using Conjure Animals. The spell I am going to take right now is Summon Fey. This is going to be kind of an alternative to Summon Beast. It's going to be stronger than a second level spell used on Summon Beast, and it will be stronger than a third level spell for Summon Beast as well. And that's because this creature is doing some force damage in addition to its non-magical damage. Also, as I mentioned, Potentially, we could give the Summon Fey a magical short sword, and therefore all the damage would be reliable. Now, how do we keep our Fey Spirit safe? Well, our best bet that way is probably to have it go into melee, make its attack, and then use its Fey Step to get out of melee. And that means we're not going to get the Fuming bonus action. And so no advantage on the attack. If we want that advantage on the attack, we should expect our Fey Spirit to probably go down after a round or two which might be fine for the situation, but in terms of my calculations, I did not assume advantage. So maybe we can make use of the Mirthful ability or the Trixie ability. My assumption is we'll probably be using Summon Fey for two combats, and I generally assume eight combats a day. So probably two out of eight combats a day we'll have Summon Fey up, uh, and then for four combats a day we'll have our Summon Beast. And yes, I do realize that that's a lot of combats for a day, I like to do worst case scenario uh, when I do calculations and then it's a conservative number, right? Rather than uh, assuming that you're going to be able to use limited abilities all the time. Level 11 is a big level for us and for all Beastmasters level 11 is a big level. Rangers don't always see a really nice damage boost at level 11 but Beastmaster is an exception to that and that is because our pet gets an additional attack. And our pet getting an additional attack is basically just an extra attack. So like a fighter, we're going to get an additional attack at level 11. This creates a significant damage boost for this character at that level. Now at level 10, we also got Nature's Veil. This allows us to use a bonus action to turn invisible. And we remain invisible until the start of our next turn. Now the issue with Nature's Veil is for us, it uses a bonus action. So if we use Nature's Veil, then our beast is not getting an attack. That doesn't mean we'll never use Nature's Veil. I can definitely see using it, but I'd probably not be thinking of it primarily as offensive, because if we are going to use it to just get the advantage to attack, that doesn't actually pay off, because the extra damage is not going to make up for not attacking with your beast. 
where I could see nature's veil coming up is if we wanted to go defensive because then we're going to have disadvantage on being attacked and our creature if we're not commanding them takes the dodge action automatically so the creature is more defensive we're more defensive and then we'll still get advantage with our attack rolls and that'll at least make up some of the difference for our beast not attacking so will I use nature's veil yeah I'm almost certainly to use it I just don't expect it to really increase the damage of this character but it's another defensive layer for this character which is nice but the really big thing here is the bestial flurry if you command the beast to take the attack action it makes two attacks and that is basically double the offensive output of the pet now my calculations generally have this pet doing about five points of damage around before level 11 so we're getting an additional five points of damage around we're also getting an additional third level spell and I'm going to grab plant growth there is a lot of really good things about plant growth it not using concentration is amazing it essentially has a permanent duration it has a great range a huge area of effect and it provides no saving throw so you can create terrain that requires four times movement to go through and you have control of where that occurs and where it doesn't occur within the gigantic area now the issue with plant growth is that presumably you need plants in the first place and your DM has to kind of determine which plants are affected and how much of that area you actually can change with your plant growth and that's going to depend from DM to DM but certainly if we're in a wilderness environment and we're expecting things like grasses and weeds and trees and bushes plant growth is something we can make huge huge use out of and we can do it at the same time as we have our summoned creature up or we have our favorite foe up because it's not using our concentration so levels 12 and 13 at level 12 we're increasing our dexterity up to 20 so at this point now we're almost certain to be better off just switching to light armor and we're gonna have the best chance to hit with our longbow that we can get with this character and that again is where most of our damage is coming from and I just want to mention our primal awareness is also getting better as our levels go up so in addition to speak animals now we can cast beast sense once a day speak with plants once a day and locate creature once a day we're going to get access to fourth level spells at this level we're going to have one casting and there are a number of ways we could go here again like with conjure animals I'll mention conjure woodland beings is a very strong spell again not as table friendly as the summoning spells and tashes but from a mechanical sense maybe your best bet not what I'm going to recommend the spell I'm going to recommend is guardian of nature now guardian of nature works well with both ranged and melee builds we get slightly different benefits either way but with the ranged build we take the great tree form and that's going to give us some temporary hit points we make constitution saving throws with advantage that's lovely being that we're going to have good constitution saving throws in the first place advantage means pretty much we're guaranteed success if we're making a constitution saving throw we also make dexterity and wisdom based attacks with advantage so that means we're getting advantage on our longbow attacks and the area around us is going to have 15 feet of difficult terrain that means that melee creatures are going to have a more difficult time getting to us now this uses our bonus action so it's not something I would do lightly in combat what I'd probably do is at this level I'm very likely to upcast summon Fey and just get that extra attack per round but if I have a chance to prep for a combat beforehand guardian of nature is something I would definitely consider just for that advantage to attack where we're really gonna see guardian of nature become more effective is level 15 because at that level we'll be able to share spells with our beast and that means we can cast guardian of nature and we're going to get it and the beast is going to get it and if we look at the great tree we make dexterity and wisdom based attack rolls with advantage and the pet is making wisdom based attacks because it is using your spell attack modifier which is based on your wisdom so it will also benefit from guardian of nature and get advantage on attacks so at level 14 we're going to get vanish not something I'm going to use a lot it gives you a hide action as a bonus action again we just we don't have our bonus action so most of the time we're not going to be able to use this uh, share spells we will definitely use and that is where we cast a spell targeting ourselves, and it can affect our beast companion as well ideally that spell will be guardian of nature when we can set it up 
with combat preparation. Once we're in combat, not as good. But there's other uses for share spells as well. Share spells is really good. For example, we get hit with a fireball. I cast absorb elements. My beast will also get the advantage of the absorb elements. So it's just an ability that's really nice to have. We're also going to get additional spell known. I don't see the point in getting another spell known at higher levels because we're pretty much knowing what we're going to be casting with those slots. So I'm going to go back to the lower levels where we have more slots. And at this point I'm going to pick up Dark Vision. This is a nice utility spell to have. We're going to get one additional fourth level spell, so we're either doing an upcast summoning spell or second guardian of nature per day. And then we're going to get to 17th level. At 16th level we're going to get an ability score improvement and now we're going to start to increase our wisdom. This gives our pet a better chance to hit, it gives our summoned creatures a better chance to hit, it gives our spell DCs a boost, and it helps a saving throw that comes up reasonably often. Now I could consider a feat here, and I think feat might be okay. We could do something like lucky, but there's nothing in terms of feats that I think are must-haves at this point. I think this is a good point for us to go wisdom. And speaking of spells that are going to benefit from our wisdom going up, at this level, we're going to have access to fifth level spells, and the spell I'm going to recommend is Steel Wind Strike. So why not Swift Quiver? Well, the problem with the Swift Quiver is it uses your bonus action every single round. We just don't have it. And it really actually doesn't increase our damage much at all because we're already attacking twice with our bonus action. We're just doing it through the pet. So the Swift Quiver doesn't really give us anything. It's just using up our concentration and our fifth level spell. But Steel Wind Strike we can absolutely use. It doesn't use our concentration. So we can do it at the same time as we say do Guardian of Nature. And ideally, we will. We'll use Steel Wind Strike either on turns where we have Guardian of Nature or if we don't have Guardian of Nature up we're going to use our Nature's Veil ability as a bonus action to get invisibility before we use Steel Wind Strike because it's way better to give up the beast attack on the round you use Steel Wind Strike if it gives you advantage because you're going to be making five melee spell attacks and if we can do them with advantage it's going to be way more damage and so my assumption is we're going to have one fifth level slot this is what we'll use it on. Five creatures you're going to make a melee spell attack on each of them we're using our wisdom, our wisdom is at 18 right now so reasonably good we're likely going to be doing so with advantage we really should be doing it with advantage and it does 60 10 force damage to each of those five targets that we hit. So my damage calculations assume we will be using steel wind strike once per day with advantage. Now if we go right to 20th level, this is what else happens. At 18th level we'll get Feral Senses, and this is not something that's going to come up a lot, but when we attack a creature we can't see, our inability to see it doesn't impose disadvantage on your attack rolls against it. This is something we could actually combine when we use Summon Fey, because when we use Summon Fey, it's going to be doing its face step after attacking. If we do the one where we get that five foot of magical darkness, then when we attack a creature, we're going to have advantage from them being blinded to us and disadvantage from us being blinded to them, but we won't because of feral senses, so we just get advantage to attack when we use summon face. So something you can take advantage of. I didn't put it into my damage calculations because at this level a lot of things have true sight a lot of things can see through magical darkness so this isn't always going to be something you can use but that is one way you can use it we're also going to get our wisdom score up to 20 so we're now going to have a very strong DC for our spells uh, it helps our saving throws as well of course and naturally the to hit bonuses of our pet and our summon creatures and then we get our capstone which actually isn't awful anymore uh, and that is because of the changes that happen to the ranger and the way that we're likely to build it. So once on each of your turns you can add your wisdom modifier to the attack roll or damage roll of an attack you make against one of your favored enemies. So favored foe we will be able to use six times in a day. So our favored foe ability works with the foe slayer feature. So that means six times a day we can set up an enemy as a favored foe and when we do so we're going to be able to get either a plus five to hit or a plus five damage depending on whether we needed it to hit or for damage. 
So this actually becomes reasonably decent because number one, favored foe is going to be far more flexible for us than favored enemy. And number two, because we actually had a reason to increase our wisdom, is going to be 20 instead of the 14 I would have normally expected before Tashes. So if we look at our final build, first thing we're going to see is our saving throws are pretty decent. We've got a really good dexterity, a good constitution save, and our wisdom save actually isn't bad either. Our passive perception score with this character ends at 27 with a perception modifier of plus 17. 184 hit points is very solid for a 20th level character, really solid for a range character. Armor class of 17 base, obviously it's not going to be 17 at 20th level. But I haven't added any magical equipment here. Initiative modifier plus 5, that is solid. In terms of our spells, largely because of primeval awareness, we're going to have a lot of utility options here. So outside of combat, this is going to be a character that is going to have a lot of things they can do to kind of contribute to those out of combat challenges. In combat, it's going to be kind of a mix of, of solid offense with solid defense. So if we look at this character's damage versus the baseline, once again, as I mentioned at level 4, we're going to see there is a dip here, and that is because we went with the Resilient Constitution feat. But that Resilient Constitution feat does bring a lot for us. It just doesn't bring any damage for us. And so we see a little dip at level 4. But we can see we get so much at level 5 that that jumps right back up into a very comfortable position. We're comfortably above baseline. And we actually end well above baseline with this character. So the damage here is solid. And you can see overall the increase is pretty consistent. The damage is going up on a lot of levels here. So we're actually seeing not kind of the steps we see with the baseline, but more of a constant flow upwards. Though we definitely see some bigger jumps at certain levels. Level 5, level 11, level 17, we see bigger jumps for this character for damage. But the only level where we're really, really close to the baseline is level 1. And level 1 usually runs by pretty quick. And this build never goes below the baseline. And other than level 1, it's never even really close to falling below the baseline. It's not the best damage build we can make. It's not even the best ranger damage build we can make. If we really wanted to maximize the damage on this graph for this character, we'd be taking conjure animals at third level. We'd be taking conjure woodland beings. Uh, uh, but you can see that even without those spells, this build is still doing fine. And it's a lot more friendly for the table because we can still do decent damage with this character, enough damage to feel like we're contributing to combat. We have enough other things we can do that are going to make this character feel useful. We have lots of utility options, we have some good skill options, and our defense wasn't given up. We have good saving throws, we have good hit points. We have a lot of defensive things we can do, like doing invisibility as a bonus action. And this build is easy, right? Archery is easy to use, the Beast of the Air is easy to use. The Beast of the Sky is easy to use. We don't need to think too hard about tactics. Stay out of melee, shoot things. So I think this is also a good build if you are looking at introducing a player to the game. This is a character that's pretty easy to play and is going to have them feel like they're contributing. For the more experienced players who are looking for tactical challenges in combat, then I would think about going with the melee build. Go with the melee creature that might knock your enemy prone, giving you advantage on your great weapon master attacks. And you're going to have to think about positioning. You're going to have to think about when your pet is going to attack, when it might want to withdraw to keep it alive. And to be honest, that's probably the build I would play most of the time because this build is kind of novice, but novice but solid. And we are going to get some variations, because sometimes we're summoning beasts, sometimes we're summoning fae, sometimes we're using guardian of nature, sometimes we're using favored foe. So there are a lot of things that are kind of coming into the mix. So that's the Beastmaster Ranger. Next week I'm going to start looking at the subclasses for a ranger that came out in Tasha's. We have the Fey Wanderer and we have the Swarm Keeper. So I hope you'll join me for those. Until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everyone. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.